So uh, there's a lot I could say about how the virus works in the epithelium. There's an enormous amount that isn't known. I, I guess what we're trying to do is trying to look at what the clinical problems are that these viruses cause and try and where possible to consider how the molecular understanding of the virus actually explains what the virus does. And so in the lab, what we do is we have uh, a number of projects that are mole pure molecular projects, even protein structure projects, but centered to the lab's activities really are the use of model systems to try and recreate how the virus works in the epithelium. And these are rafts and animal models. And on the other side, this always has spin-offs into clinical research. So we end up also looking more and more at biopsy material to try and explain or, or really to validate some of the molecular uh, results and ideas which come out of the work. And I think what I want to do today really is not to go over a lot of fine detail molecular analysis. I'll show you some data uh, when it's necessary, but I'll, I'll really just try and dwell on some of the concepts which are emerging and some of the ideas which are emerging uh, as to how the virus might work and uh, why it causes serious disease sometimes. So I'm not going to give a massive introduction, but I'm going to go over some of the things about the papillomaviruses which I think are important. And I really want to put the papillomaviruses in the context because if you just consider how they've evolved and the evolution of the viruses and why they've ended up doing things is actually quite a, an, an interest to us and we keep coming back to it when we find differences between different virus groups. If we look at papillomaviruses, the current thinking is that these are very old viruses and they've been around or the common ancestor of the whole papillomavirus group was around 350 million years ago or so at the time when dinosaurs were around and the idea is that dinosaurs had papillomavirus infections and in the dinosaur group that the papillomaviruses of a uh, was a bit faint actually become extinct with the with the, the host organisms now i think the thinking of why papillomaviruses have, have come from this uh, this source so long ago is that they're found in a whole range of different um, species which exist today. And the idea really is that papillomaviruses tend to evolve in a host-specific manner with very, very little uh, cross-species transmission. So that as these different hosts have evolved, the idea is the different papillomaviruses evolve with them. And so we find papillomaviruses in turtle, snakes, birds, and in mammals. But of course, they've been evolving separately for millions and millions of years. So although they all infect differentiated epithelium, they have a number of characteristics which are similar, which are essential, which have been preserved for them to infect differentiated epithelium, but they pick up a number of differences. And so these viruses are all curious and then they, they actually have a number of differences which allow them to infect the different species and to work in slightly different ways. Now, of course, in the humans, we're following a particular branch and humans have ended up with hundreds of papillomaviruses. And probably turtles have hundreds of papillomaviruses too, but people are not very interested in them. So if we look at the humans and look at the papillomaviruses in humans, I just want to introduce these groups because I can tell you some of the groups that we work on amongst this evolutionary tree. So human papillomaviruses have been classified into these five broad evolutionary groups. groups. And of these, the alpha papillomaviruses are generally considered at the moment the most important because most of the serious medical conditions are caused by alpha papillomaviruses and this includes a range of cancers. Now the alpha papillomavirus group is divided into a number of different categories and one of the important categories of these is the viruses which cause genital warts and these are viruses which are H, such as HV6 and 11 which are often classified as low-risk papillomaviruses. These cause these very important medical conditions, genital warts and laryngeal papillomas are very, very difficult to treat. Uh, people who have, so genital warts, most people who present for genital warts still have the lesions three months after treatment. So they're not actually, so 30% have lesions three months after treatment, so they're not reliably treated. And things like laryngeal papillomas, particularly when they occur in, in young adults or children, are very, very problematic and only be, to be treated by repeat surgery. So although these are classified as low-risk papillomaviruses, they're actually an important medical problem. And there's actually no antiviral currently available for low-risk papillomaviruses, or really any papillomavirus. So the only treatment generally for papillomavirus infections is some way of removing the disease, some way of surgery. And this applies to cervical lesions as well as laryngeal lesions. Uh, surgery is a, is a common way of treating papillomavirus lesions, although other methods such as immune modulators can be effective under some conditions.
So when we consider low-risk papillomavirus, this group's often classified as low-risk papillomaviruses, but I really think that many of the papillomaviruses which infect humans should be considered as low-risk. So HPV1 and HPV4 will cause plantar walks, verrucas on the soles of the feet, children that go to the swimming pool get these lesions, they regress spontaneously. So you're getting the picture, really the most papillomaviruses are low risk and they cause lesions which are not a particularly long-term problem, unless they occur at particular sites which are problematic, such as in the, the oral cavity and the, the in, can hinder breathing. So if we come back to the alpha papillomavirus group, because I want to really spend most of my time talking about this group, not all of them are problematic. I mentioned the low-risk mucosal ones, which cause genital warts, laryngeal lesions. Of course, there's a big cluster of these, which cause just cutaneous lesions. And HPV2 is the most prevalent of these, probably. And it causes these type of things. Common warts, which nearly all children get early on in life, they'll, or ad young adults early in life, they'll persist for months or years. They'll usually regress. They're purely benign epithelial lesions. So most papillomaviruses, I think, don't cause... Uh, lesions which progress to cancer. They just cause benign lesions which the, the host immune system gets on top of and actually clears usually spontaneously. Now if we just consider the papillomavirus which is shown on the left there as the particle, of course uh, if we now go to what the particles like, they're very small viruses, they're only 50 nanometers, they only have a little bit of space inside them and the viral genomes are shown on the right there in the electron micrograph. They, they're an epizomal circle, and this circle is 8,000 base pairs. And if we look at the alpha papillomavirus genome organization, they, they have a control, typically they have a control sequence shown in blue, and a range of genes. And uh, some of these genes are obviously very familiar to you, such as E6 and E7. And the genes together are involved in taking over the epithelium following infection. And I want to talk about this group of genes in particular because these are the ones which the alpha papillomaviruses have. And usually the viral genome is shown like this with the DNA as a, as a circle in the middle. I'm not sure I've got much power on that. So the genome is a circle in the middle and the, the viral genes are shown around the outside. So if we consider the alpha papillomaviruses and consider papillomaviruses in general, I mentioned they've all evolved with their different hosts and they've all got slightly different ways in which they're working. If we look at papillomaviruses in general, we find that the, the common characteristics amongst these viruses when we think about them is that they, they have a couple of proteins which are involved in replication. These are key replication and transcription factor proteins which are involved in, in driving... Uh, so E1's a viral helicase, which is necessary for replication of the viral genome. And all papillomaviruses, whether it's the bird one or the turtle one, have these couple of genes. And they also have genes which are involved in virus packaging. But I think the way they work is they've, they've got this extra space where they can pick up extra functions. And this is the, these are really the spaces where the papillomavirus picks up accessory genes. And in the case of the alpha papillomavirus, which cause human genes, the accessory genes are these very familiar E6 and E7 proteins which not all papillomaviruses have in exactly the same form. And E5, which not all papillomaviruses have. And E4, which seems to function as an accessory gene too. So they've got a, a, a basically core structure along with accessory genes, which vary even between the human papillomaviruses and vary more distantly between papillomaviruses from different species. So if we now just focus on the high-risk papillomaviruses, because that's what most work has been done on over the last 10 or 15 or, or slightly more years, and this is the, the high-risk papillomaviruses, the ones which are associated with human cancers, are the ones which we understand by far the most in terms of the molecular biology of how the proteins work. So, of course, the high-risk papillomaviruses, on this evolutionary tree, the two branches there, but this is an evolutionary tree based on the lay proteins, and this separates the high-risk papillomaviruses into two groups, and the most prominent ones are HPV-16, which causes cervical lesions, genital lesions, but about half of all cervical cancers, and HPV-18, which causes uh, about a quarter of all cervical cancers. So if we consider what these type of uh, viruses cause, we're always very interested in relating what the viruses cause to the molecular biology of how they work. High-risk papillomaviruses generally in the most of the population cause lesions which people don't know they have. They cause these type of flat lesions. This is a penile lesion there. Uh, nobody, these, these people with these lesions wouldn't present for treatment. The lesions don't cause any particular trouble. They can visualize in the clinic by the application of uh, yeah, dilute acetic acid, shown here. And of course, these are sexually transmitted viruses, so they infect men as well as women. And they cause these type of inner cervical lesions. Now, it's a particular, so 
These viruses, of course, they can cause, in most of the case, they can cause inapparent infections. They cause benign lesions. They cause lesions which produce virus particles, and that's what these are. However, in a small number of instances, lesions of particular sites, particularly the cervix, can progress to cancers. Now, it's not just about the virus as far as we're concerned, it's about the site of infection too. And I think you can get an indication of this just when you consider uh, the number of cancers attributed at two different sites to high-risk papillomavirus infections. So that uh, at the cervix, for instance, there's about half a million cases of cervical cancer a year per worldwide, and close on 100% of them are associated with human papillomavirus uh, infection and human papillomavirus gene deregulation. If you consider penile sites, of course, these are sexually transmitted virus they find in men just as frequently as women, if not more so. Incidence of, of penile cancer is actually very low, about 40,000 cases a year, and only half of those, 20,000 cases a year, associated with papillomavirus. So the site of infection is very important. So it's partly a problem between the virus and partly a problem in the cell that the virus gets into sometimes, and particular cell types are more of a problem than others. So... If I can just go into this a little bit more, what is it about the cervix which is a particular problem? Well, I think the current understanding really, and this is something we have to think about when we're trying to understand how papillomaviruses work properly and how they sometimes work uh, incorrectly, is consider the site of infection. Of course, if we look at this, this is a, a, a cervical biopsy, just showing how the cervix is structured. And we have a number of different types of epithelial cell which the virus can actually gain access to. And we don't know in all cases what happens when the virus gains access to these different types of cells, but we have the stratified cells, the, the differentiated epithelium of the cervix, so the ectocervix. We have this region known as the transformation zone, very important region because this is where most of the cervical cancers arise. And our understanding, our thinking really is this is a site where the papillomaviruses particularly have a lot of trouble in expressing their genes properly. And this is a problem. This is one of the sites where cancers arise in conjunction with papillomavirus infection. And of course, we have columnar cells of the endocervix, reserve cells, which are the stem cells, which underlie uh, this type of tissue. And we have glandular cells too. This type of epithelium is an epithelium which started off as just being a columnar layer, a single cell layer thick. And at a particular time in a woman's life, it changes to become stratified. So it's a metaplastic epithelium. It's an epithelium which changes its characteristics at a particular time. And it's typically these sort of uh, slightly curious types of epithelium where the high-risk papillomaviruses cause cancers. So this is something to bear in mind when we're trying to understand how the papillomaviruses work and why uh, gene expression may not work uh, correctly. So... If I can just summarise some of our current thinking now by just going to this, this movie, which I've shown in a number of different ways previously, but I just want to show it here, really to illustrate uh, some of the things which we think are important about the papilloma life cycle and some things which we don't understand. So most of you all know this. This is just how the skin works, basically, with cells in the basal layer of the epithelium dividing. And as they divide, they produce daughter cells, and these daughter cells are pushed towards the surface because these cells continue to divide. In the normal epithelium, these daughter cells differentiate as they push towards the surface. They will exit the cell cycle. They will express various differentiation proteins. They will secrete lipids. They will do all the things that the skin needs to to make the epithelial barrier. Now, the current thinking is that the virus gains access to the basal cells of the epithelium. And from work of many people, particularly the NIH groups, uh, the virus is thought to bind to the basal lamina, and as the lesion uh, repairs itself, the virus adheres to the outside of the cell and the viral genome gets in, and the viral genome establishes itself as a multi-copy uh, episome in the cell of the basal layer. Now, when we think about this, there's a number of different events going here. We've got a virus getting into a cell and starting its gene expression. And one of the things which people think is important at this particular stage is the wound healing environment that the virus infected cell finds itself in. And this is something which is poorly understood, but the actual formation of infection 
Current thinking really suggests it may be partly due to the expression of the viral genes E6 and E7, which drive cell proliferation, but partly because the cell is in a wound healing environment, which is fine by particular, surrounded by particular growth factors. And this environment creates a situation where the initial infected cell can amplify from being one cell to being many, many hundreds of cells. And this is the way the virus is thought to establish itself uh, as a reservoir of infected cells in the basal layer. So some of this is hypothesis and some of this is sort of a proven. Now, of course, as these uh, infected cells divide and move towards the surface of the epithelium, they undergo, well, they're subject to the normal differentiation signals of the, of the, the epithelium. But, of course, the virus-infected cells are not differentiating normally. It's a compromise between the virus trying to drive the cells into cycle and the cell succumbing to the differentiating signals which it's surrounded by. So I think what's important for us are things like the environment of the cell, particularly during the wound healing phase, during the different differentiated phase of the cell, including what's happening in the base of the layer and what's happening in the upper layers, and how these things work together to lead to a normal productive infection. So what I've got here is actually a normal productive infection by a high-risk papillomavirus. And if we took a cervical biopsy infected by a high-risk papillomavirus, we might in fact expect a pattern like this, with cells being driven into cycle here, shown by the cells in red, cells expressing certain viral genes at higher level here, such as E1 and E2, which is where the copy number is amplified, and we can go from 20 or 100 copies up to hundreds of thousands of copies from here to here. And then the virus triggering its late stage, which will be the viral late proteins such as L2 and L1, so that it can package the amplified particles into, into amplified genomes into virions. Now, a key thing for us, really, when we look at this, is the, the differences in the way different papillomaviruses work. And I just want to focus now on the two groups I mentioned earlier, which is the high-risk papillomavirus group and the low-risk papillomavirus group because one are associated cancers and one aren't associated with cancers. And the picture I've got here really is, a, is the type of expression pattern we typically see in cervical lesions caused by high-risk papillomaviruses. And the key thing about what the high-risk papillomaviruses often do is drive cells in the lower layers of the epithelium into cycle. And I presume this is something that the high-risk viruses need to do for their life cycle. But if we consider what low-risk viruses do, and this is something we're starting to do more and more work on now, the low-risk viruses complete a life cycle in a slightly different way, as far as we're concerned. They don't seem to maintain this very high level uh, ability to drive cells into the cell cycle in the lower layers. What they do is cause cells to reactivate and re-enter the cell cycle at a particular moment. The end product is that both of them make viruses of the epithelial surface but they work in a slightly different way in the basal cells. So for us, it's becoming quite important as to what happens in the basal cells and what happens in the upper layers in terms of the viral proteins. And it's quite interesting that the viruses associated with cancers have this particular ability to affect the basal cells. So I don't want to go too much into this, but just show this picture, which I think I showed before, which sort of illustrates this point. This is now... I'm going to show you two particular, two clinical images here of biopsies, cervical biopsies caused by HPV-16 or HPV-11, HPV-16 being a high-risk papillomavirus. And this is stained with two of the markers I'm going to repeatedly show during the talk. This is in red. It's a cellular protein called MCM. It's a, it's a, a marker of cells which are in cycle. We could have used PCNA or CHI-67 and got a very similar result. And the, the green stain is a, a viral protein E4, which comes on at the time that the virus replicates its genomes to high levels. So this is a, an indicator of where genome amplification is occurring. And this is, the red is an indicator of cells which have been driven into cycle. And this is a cervical lesion caused by a high-risk papillomavirus, and cells are being driven into cycle in the base of layers very, very potently. If you come outside the lesion, you see uh, this is actually looking a little bit weaker already. And you can see mitotic figures here. I think what we typically find in, in low-risk papillomavirus infections and in warts in general are the basal cells don't have this massive uh, drive into the cell cycle. And we get the cell cycle being triggered above the basal layer, presumably so the virus can amplify its genomes in the upper layers. So 
It seems to be uh, either a life cycle strategy difference or a particular problem that the viruses have a particular site which allow them to do this stuff to the cells in the lower layers of the epithelium, which papillomaviruses in general don't need to. And I think this is probably part of the reason why some viruses associated cancer and some aren't, because they affect the basal cells differently. So if we now just go back to the movie, I'll just finish one more thing about this. So I mentioned about the site of infection being a, a particular problem. Well, we'll have to go back to a high-risk infection again, which is shown here. So this is a, a low-grade neoplasia. And if we just look at what happens uh, at particular sites, or what can happen at particular sites, we get this cancer progression that starts from the neoplasia. And the particular sites that are the problem, of course, are the cervical transformation zone, a particular type of epithelial cell which has trouble controlling the virus, I guess. And at this side, the virus seems to express its genes incorrectly, and this is manifest as cervical neoplasia of different grades. Cervical neoplasia grade 1, 2 or 3, depending on how far cell cycle entry has pushed towards the upper layers. And the current idea is the overexpression of the viral genes leads to a progressive... Uh, progressively more serious impact on the cellular proteins which they target, which eventually leads to the inability to repair secondary genetic changes. And I guess one of the key interactions is the association of high-risk E6 with P53, which uh, takes out the cellular DNA damage response. So it gives you an idea about how we're thinking about how papillomaviruses cause disease. So if I just return now... In terms of studying this, there's a couple of ways we do it in, in our lab. Um, and I mentioned we use molecular studies and analysis of clinical material and, uh, and model systems. And I just want to show you the, some of the different types of things we do and just then just talk about the three different types of projects which we have going and how they hopefully can provide some insight into what the virus is up to. So I just want to show, start off by showing a clinical image. This is now... Uh, biopsy material. This is a, a piece of tissue of someone was who was treated for a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade 2 caused by a papillomavirus. And the treatment is, it's a surgical removal of the transformation zone. That's the current treatment for this type of disease. Now, when we get a biopsy like this, we can analyze it and we can, we can think about some of the things that I, I said and the way which we think the virus works. So if we look at this piece of tissue, this is a uh, the transformation zone starts here. And we know it's the transformation zone because underneath this piece of epithelium are these glands. And the transformation zone runs down here and eventually converts to the columnar cells which form the lining at the entrance to the womb, which would be up here. And there's an area of, this is a H&E stain, there's an area of abnormality here, which is perhaps a little bit difficult to see this magnification, but you can see how the basal cells look here and you can see that this there's a difference between here and here. I can actually show this more clearly because before we did the H&E, we did a stain with the cell, the cell cycle marker MCM, which I showed you previously. And we can see here, the cells are driven in cycle above the basal layer here, and they're not here. This is MCM in the basal layer, which is normal. And then here, something changed. And this is an area of neoplasia. And one of the techniques which we've found very useful over the last few years is to use laser capture microscopy to look at these types of biopsies and to cut bits out and then to work out what's happening in these bits we cut out. And the idea is to eventually be able to cut bits out and look at gene expression patterns. But in this one, what we did is cut bits out and just look at whether there was any HPV present. And we found in this piece of tissue, there are two different papillomaviruses, which are associated with the SIN2 disease here. And also there was HPV16, which was present in this gland region which appeared to be causing or correlating with these little areas of proliferation in this glandular tissue. Now, the glandular tissue isn't typically a differentiated epithelium. So this isn't a site where you would be expecting HPV16 to go through a productive life cycle. And if we look a bit more closely at this tissue, we find this single-celled epithelium, and then the areas where we find the, the HPV16 infection have this... Uh, peculiar proliferative capacity. And it's possible, this is sort of suggests that 
although it's not definitive, that the virus is actually getting into different types of epithelial cells and causing different types of disease when it gets into, into these different cells. And it's known that people can actually, soon after infection, manifest with CIN2 or CIN3. Not all CIN3 is necessary to progress over years or decades. You can manifest with CIN3 quite soon after infection. And I guess one possibility is you've infected a, an inappropriate cell type and you've, the virus has actually expressed its genes inappropriately and is driving cell proliferation. And I think we, we get the general, we come back to the general thinking about tumor viruses here, that the tumor viruses can be well behaved when they're in, a, in an appropriate site but can actually cause tumours when they're in an inappropriate site, such as the way adenoviruses do in uh, experimental animal model systems. So I want to move away from that. That's, that's some of the, the way which we're thinking about papillomaviruses and papillomaviruses disease. Uh, you can do a lot by the analysis of clinical material and laser capture. And you know, what we want to do is trying to push those methods as much as you can. But clearly, there are some things you might never be able to do by the analysis of clinical material. Uh, I think one of the other systems which we and a number of other people use to try and understand papillomavirus infections is, is this one, which is the raft system. And what you basically do in this, because I'll describe a few things about it that we've, and a few conclusions which we've reached from it. You propagate in culture skin cells, keratinocytes. You, you would like to propagate cells which are as close to possible to the cells which the virus naturally infects. So you might consider propagating cervical epithelial cells. Whether you can mimic the transformation zone in this system is a bit of an open question at the moment, but it's not going to be easy. But you can certainly propagate keratinocytes, skin cells, and you can propagate, propagate keratinocyte cell lines, such as the ones we use, which is this uh, NIC cell line, which was originally um, pioneered as a, as a model for papillomavirus infection by Paul Lambert in Madison. So the way we use this is we put a papillomavirus genome in here, along with a drug-resistant selectable marker. And then we select for cells which have got the selectable marker. And most of those cells will also have the papillomavirus genome. So when we've done this with HPV-16, we've managed to get a large number of cell lines which maintain the HPV-16 viral episome when you pass them. And these, we hope, are a little bit like the infected basal cells that you might have find in, in infected tissue in people. And the approach you can do to study this a bit more is to take these cells with the viral episomes in and propagate them in raft culture. And when you do this, they will mimic, they will differentiate to mimic uh, something which looks like um, the sort of tissue you might get uh, from biopsy from patients. And I've, I've explained this type of approach before and explained some of the preliminary results. And I just want to say one or two things about it because it's an ongoing piece of work. With HPV-16, we found we had a whole range of different cell lines. And when we propagated in the RAF culture, they had slightly different phenotypes. They didn't actually all come out uniformly the same. They didn't all RAF to produce nice productive infections. Some RAF to produce uh, slightly abnormal types of rafts, which look a bit more like the CIN2, which you get in patients. And when we stain with the various markers, we find that they actually stain a little bit like uh, productive infections or CIN2 with this one having a lot of E4, which means a lot of entry in the late phase. And this one would have a lot of virus production. This one has a lot of proliferation, a lot of cells being driven into cycle, even reaching the surface of the raft with very, very few cells triggering the late phase of the life cycle. So it looked really as though we were getting uh, different types of rafts which reflected some of the different types of, of uh, tissue which we get when we get biopsies from the clinic. So of course it's very, very interesting then to wonder why these uh, are actually um, producing different phenotypes. And I think when we look at these we get a, a whole range of different phenotypes which we can grade uh, in terms of their similarity to clinical material. And I think I've, I've mentioned this before, I want to just reiterate some of these points. Our current thinking, when we, when, we, when we look at these cells, of course, the cells which give rise to these rafts can be analyzed in monolayer culture in great detail. And the key things that when we found, when we use a, a, an extraction procedure which extracts the soluble protein in the cell, we find quite dramatic differences in the amount of the viral proteins which we can pull out. 
So that in the cells which give rise to this type of raft, we can pull out E6 actually very, very poorly, so there's very little of it that we can extract. If we take the cells which give this type of raft, of course, we can also pull out very little of it, but when the cells pack up and become confluent in the dish, E6 protein is actually much, much easier to extract. It suggests there's something different here about the way in which the viral proteins are being expressed or localized within the cell. And we get a similar sort of thing with E7. And broadly speaking, these different expression patterns make some sense in terms of the phenotypes which we're seeing. But we don't fully understand why these expression patterns and why these uh, different extraction, uh, we can extract different amounts of the different proteins like this from the different cells. One of the things which does seem to hold up is when we look at the E6 levels, and this just takes one time point, the ones which generally have low levels of E6 generally have the higher levels of P53, which makes some sense. The ones which have the higher levels of E6 tend to have the lower levels of, of P53, although not exactly. And we see a similar thing when we compare RB levels with P16 levels. Now, there's quite a lot which we, we now are trying to understand about these cells and how the viral gene expression can, can lead to the different uh, pathologies we see in the raft. But I think one of the things which we're very interested in, in the way these different groups of cells grow when we put them into tissue culture. So the ones which manifest as the high-grade phenotypes when we raft them seem to have a, a problem in, in becoming cell-cell contacted when the dishes get full. And they seem to grow. But when they, when they reach this stage where the cells, where the low-risk ones actually reach confluent and stop growing, and when the low-risk ones basically form a dish of cells like this, the high-risk ones seem to be able to ignore this cell-cell contact inhibition signal and just get smaller and smaller in the dish, which gives us an idea that there's a difference between the high-risk uh, difference between the way in which the virus gene expression can occur to lead these different types of phenotype, these different phenotypes. Now, of course, there's a number of things which you want to do with these different cell lines to understand. I just want to throw in one other recent observation, just to perhaps to get some feedback on this. We're obviously very interested in which of the viral proteins are necessary to cause these different effects. And we know from the sort of work we've done and the work of others that the the key protein that's necessary to drive cells into cycle in the upper layers of the epithelium, the key protein which is necessary to allow cells to, to go into a stage where they can amplify their genomes, is the E7 protein. And when we make cell lines with expressing just the E7 protein or the E67 protein, we find cells in the raft are driven into cycle above the base layer. But we don't find this when we make cells which express E6, which leads us to conclude, tentative include, which is what other people think, think too, is that E7 is primarily responsible for driving cells in cycle above the base layer to allow genome amplification. But we have curious results like this. When we consider what's happening in monolayer cells, we find that when we put E7 into monolayer cells, and these are cells which are growing in a gro rich growth factor environment, we've not found that the E7 makes a dramatic difference to the growth rate unless we have E6 present too, which makes you wonder whether E6 protein is very, very critical for driving cells uh, into cycle and to proliferate into the basal layer, and that E6 is primarily responsible, has a key role for this enhanced proliferation in the basal layer. And you've got to remember this enhanced proliferation in the basal layer isn't something which the low-risk viruses do. So we suggest that there's a difference between the high and low risk E6 proteins, which is very important for this key event in the life cycle of the high risk viruses. I don't want to say too much more about this, but I can just summarize our life cycle thinking in this, this final sort of uh, model. If we consider what the virus does to the epithelium. So if we consider a high risk virus infection, the idea is what it's doing is it drives cells into cycle. In fact, it causes proliferation in the lower layers by the expression of its viral oncogenes E6 and E7. And the extent of this proliferation is something which pathologists note in the clinic when they diagnose a neoplasia grade 1, 2 or 3 and they decide on treatment. But there comes a particular time when the virus stops the proliferation and we think that it goes to a final series of cell cycle states before exiting into true differentiation in the upper layers. And these cell cycle states, which have been driven by the viral genes, of course affect the cellular proteins 
and affect the other viral proteins. And these different cell cycle states are necessary for completion of the virus life cycle. And we can consider the effect of these different cell cycle states on the other viral proteins. And one of these which we've looked at is the E4 protein. I just want to show what we think these different states do to this particular protein. But I could do this with E1, for instance, which has also been very well studied in terms of how the cell cycle states affect its function. So to summarize many, many years of work, we, we followed a structural project on E4 over the last uh, five or six years, and we, we found that the E4 protein is a very little viral protein, which sits in the middle of E2, and it has a, this type of hairpin structure where it folds back on itself. And the E4 protein isn't detectable in these layers, so we can remove it. If it's there, it's present at low amounts, and its function in these layers is not very clear, if at all. But the protein becomes massively upregulated at a particular moment, and it's shown in this diagram by the cells which are shown in green. And when it becomes upregulated, what we notice is that this basic loop structure becomes modified by the environment that the protein is expressed in. So that in cells which are in an S phase-like state, we find that it has a MAP kinase phosphorylation. This is type 16 now. It has a MAP kinase phosphorylation at position 3 and in 57. And this has a key structural change on the protein which compacts the loop and tends to open up these end regions. And one of the things it does by opening it up is to expose a keratin binding motif. As the cell moves towards the surface, the idea is it goes into G2 and we get a phosphorylation on the other side of the loop by cycling BCDK, which tends to open up the loop. And eventually we get a very critical cleavage event, which you think is facilitated by this opening of the loop uh, by protease calpane. Now, I don't want to show you very many bits of evidence, but one of the key things, this, this, these different events as the cell moves from the bottom to the top are very important in regulating what E4 does and probably very important in regulating what many of the other viral proteins do and their cellular targets. And it, it's always interesting to try and put uh, the targets of the viral uh, genes and the viral gene themselves in the context of these different cell cycle states. So if we just look at what's been done here, all we've done now is looking at what is the final event which happens with E4, and this is the, it's cleavage by calpane. I just want to show you, here we've made E4 in a bacterial system, and here we've added progressively large amounts of calpane, which clips off a little bit of the end terminus. What it seems to do in this case is that it exposes an amyloid fold, and we go from having a soluble protein, which is this one, to this one, which forms these uh, very, very highly ordered fiber structures. So we've got the time change in a, in a modification of the protein leading to a change in how the protein behaves. And with E4, we have this model now where we, we have a number of different modifications at particular stages doing different things. So here, in S phase-like state, we have MAP kinase modification, which exposes a keratin binding motif, which causes the protein to accumulate. And here, after the cells leave the G2 phase, we get removal of the end terminus, which allows you to form these multimers, which are amyloid fibers, which tend to cross-link the protein and cause some sort of detriment to the cell. And we think one of the major things which E4 does is to compromise the structure of the cell and perhaps do something in the late stage of the virus life cycle to facilitate infectious virus production. Now, I mentioned earlier that we thought E4 was an accessory protein. It's something which not all papillomaviruses need. It seems that most of them have it, except, curiously, the bird ones, which don't seem to have a, a recognisable E4 motif. So we think it's an accessory protein, and we've done a lot of work with knockouts. This is now... I just want to show you one of the things why we think it's an accessory protein. This is now a series of rafts taken at different time points from day 8 to day 14, showing where the the amount of genome amplification in the upper layer is shown in red. And this is the same if we remove E4, showing the amount of genome amplification actually declines. So the, the, these viral proteins are obviously working together in a, in a very carefully controlled way to optimise the amount of virus production. And uh, you need to understand how the proteins work together, I think, to fully uh, get answers to how the life cycle works. Now, I don't want to say too much more about that. I just want to now go over in the last part into, into two other projects in the lab. And one really is a spin-off of understanding how these markers are expressed, and it's a spin-off into, into cervical diagnosis and screening. So I mentioned before that at particular sites in the cervix, we have this ordered pattern where markers such as MCM shown in red are followed by markers such as E4 shown in green. And at a particular site, such as the transformation zone, 
actually the balance between these two can change. And if we take the E4 off, we find that the viral genes such as E7 are driving cell cycle entry right to the top, which is not really good for completion of the life cycle. Because the virus doesn't want to cause cell cycle entry right to the top. It wants to have time to make particles. And this really gives us uh, an idea that markers such as this might be useful in diagnosis. And I think this is now being picked up by a number of different commercial companies which we've had dealings with, such as Becton Dickinson and Ventana. So if we now consider how cervical diagnosis is made, it's being based on the pathology but because we know a little bit more about the virus life cycle, we can, we can consider just these two markers, such as MCM and E4, and show how they divide. And then consider in a high-grade neoplasia, of course, cells are being driven into cycle right to the top, so there's very, very little E4 in these cases. So the combination of the two markers gives us some indication of disease severity. And when we consider the surface of the cervix, well, we'd expect a picture like this in low-grade disease, lots of E4 at the top and L1. And as this lesion gets more serious, we'd expect a lot more MCM in the top and very little E4, all the way up to cancers. And the idea is possibly we could change the way cervical screen is done by taking surface templates where all these cells are kept in their in situ positions and perhaps apply uh, a simple panel of stains such as these. So part of this work has really been pushed forward by a collaboration over the last few years with Glaxo and Rixensart. And I think their aim was really not to develop complex diagnostic methods, but to use markers, antibodies of any sort, or even RNA or DNA, to identify when they had infections that were active, as opposed to when they had just the presence of viral genomes uh, contaminating their biopsy material. Because they're very interested in whether their vaccine is, uh, is actually preventing infection, uh, as opposed to just preventing the presence of DNA, viral DNA being there. So these are just three antibodies which we made. These are just three different E4 antibodies which we wanted to make in a type-specific way. This is a 16 type-specific E4 antibody. This is an 18 type-specific and there's a 58 type-specific. It worked out quite well. And for the 16s, this is a, a type-specific monoclonal to E4. And this is another type of analysis which we did here. The RAFT system, of course, we're using it a lot for life cycle analysis, but we can also use it to validate diagnostics. And here we've got a a type-specific 16 antibody working on a 16 raft but not on an 18 raft. And these are just an extra validation that these antibodies are working quite well. And the way, of course, they're used in the, these type of vaccine studies is that these are two biopsies which would be the sort of thing that you might find in the vaccine trials where uh, a lesion such as this might come back from the typing as having five or six different HPV types in it. Some may be actual real infections. Some may just be HPV variants at the surface. Some actually may be latent infections, i.e. no disease, but the virus is in the cell. And I think there's a desire really just to clarify what it means when you get a lot of different HPV types from a DNA typing. And in this case, uh, we could, we, it worked out quite well because there's a little region here which is diagnosed as having a, a CIN1, CINT, it's shown here. And when you're staying with E4 antibodies, there's obviously an area of active virus HV16 here. So this is a case where you could say, yes, the virus has got in and it's caused disease. So it's then very important as to whether this is a vaccinated individual or not a vaccinated individual. For our purposes, E4 antibodies can be used in this way, but I think we, we're also very interested in just using them to identify where virus disease is and as an aid to the pathologist to also distinguish whether, where, when pathology abnormalities are actually caused by the virus or not caused by the virus. Uh, and of course, we now have PANI for antibodies, which is racked a whole range of different types. And I think the way we want to use them is to do something like this, where this is a, what a pathologist would look at and diagnose some disease here and some disease here. But pathologies are very subjective, and uh, I think it, it can aid pathologists by using a molecular approach like this, where the presence of the green stain indicates absolute beyond doubt that there's a virus infection here, and the extent to which the MCM extends above the, lace, above the, the basal layer gives you some indication of disease severity. And if we look in a bit more detail, you can see how this, this sort of molecular approach works and how it relates to the standard pathology approach. So this is something I think we need to develop as a spin-off from the lab. Uh, ideally, at this stage, with diagnostic companies, that have the capacity to commercialise sort of a dual stain, a stain which isn't too complicated. 
So I just want to move on to the last bit by one or two other things which we're particularly interested in. And uh, I think a lot of the lab's work is, is sort of trying to understand the molecular events as the cell differentiates. But there's one or two other things in the papilloma field which are, are interesting to us. And one of them is this large group of, of viruses here, the beta papilloma viruses. And they were quite an interesting group because in most of the population and most of the people in this room who have, most of the people in this room will have beta infections and you don't know you've got them and they don't cause you any trouble. But if we took swabs of your skin, we'd find loads of beta viruses. They don't cause a problem unless you have an immune defect. And then the beta viruses seem to cause this sort of trouble. They're obviously regulated by the immune system. This is a person, this is a skid patient who has a, a cytokine signaling defect, can't control the beta virus infections. In this case, the person was treated by a bone marrow transplant from his brother and the lesions went away as the immune system was restored. Now, I think the thinking about the beta viruses, so there's a lot of interest in these viruses because they're suspected to be involved in cancers sometime, although not perhaps very frequently. And there's also an interest in really where they are in the general population and what are they doing. And there's an idea partly from the beta virus to try and understand whether these viruses are latent. And the whole idea of papillomavirus latency has become very, very uh, interesting topic recently. Again, partly stimulated by vaccine trials because there's a great interest in when somebody's vaccinated and then they get a lesion caused by a virus which they're vaccinated against, whether that is a reactivation of a latent infection which they always had or whether the vaccines failed and they've acquired a new infection. So the whole idea of vaccine latency is, is getting a little bit more interest because uh, there's a need to say something sensible about it in terms of a vaccination. Now, if I just finish with the beta viruses, because the beta viruses in most people might be existing in a latent form, or they might be existing in some sort of low-grade disease, a disease which you don't know you've got, but where there's virus production. And we started to look at beta virus disease, really, as a, as a follow-on from the work we've done on the alpha viruses. And we can say that there certainly are active beta virus infections here and there in the population. So one of these types of, this is now the same type of stain. This is a stain for HPV 14 E4 in, in a seborrheic keratosis. And these are sort of fairly innocuous sort of skin lesions, which uh, become more prominent as you age. And it seems that these can actually, it's always been suspected they might be associated or might be caused by beta viruses. But I think in many cases they actually are. The red here is, a, is an in situ for the HV14 DNA. You can only just see it. And the green is a, an E4 antibody. This is another one. This is Bowen's disease as a, as a slightly more serious type of condition. It, it's in some ways in appearance analogous to a SYN2 or a SYN3. Uh, but again, there's a lot of genome amplification of HV14 going in this Bowen's uh, disease sample and a lot of HV14 E4. And one of the interesting things for us is when you stain this time with E4 and PCNA, we find a lot of PCNA in the lower layers, which makes us wonder whether there is an elevated cell proliferation in the lower layers in some instances and beta virus HPV associated disease, which might start to give some sort of basis for these types associated with skin cancers in some situations. So there's obviously a lot of work to do on that to follow up what, what's happening with laser capture and other methods in the same way we've done for the alpha lesions. But I want to move to the final part, which is really a, a more thorough investigation of viral latency. And viral latency is very poorly understood. Uh, viral latency is important to understand in a number of situations. One is in, in oral lesions, in laryngeal lesions, because uh, children, infect, children in particular who have juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis, when the lesions are removed, these lesions keep coming back. And one of the thoughts here is that even though the lesion's gone, the virus actually is, is latent in the surrounding tissue and comes back. So that's one of the areas where it's thought to be viral latency is thought to occur. Another one relates to cervical lesions, where the incidence of HPV detection sort of rises in older women. And it's thought to be a possible reason is that the waning immune system leads to the copy number rising uh, late on in life. Now, to understand viral latency is quite a difficult task, I suppose, and it's not really been well studied. And I think it's something which is obviously very difficult to do in raft culture or monolayer culture, 
And for these type of things, there is really a place for animal models because you're looking at the way a particular papillomavirus behaves in a natural host. And until recently, the, the animal models of, for papillomaviruses have been fairly poor. One of the ones which we found useful is this one, which is rabid oral papillomavirus, which produces these papillomas and mucosal sites on the rabid tongue. And is considered to be a reasonable model of oral and laryngeal papilloma infections in humans, such as those caused by HB6 and 11, because the disease is very similar and follows a similar pattern. So these are experimental induced papillomas on a rabbit and a rabbit tongue and a domestic rabbit. And of course, we can follow, we can make lesions like this by scarifying the epithelium. And the lesions form, this is a lesion two weeks, this is one three weeks, and this is one four weeks, where we've got a full-blown papilloma. Now, in terms of uh, the this model, this model is actually very useful because usually the lesions don't persist. They will then start to regress over between... Uh, six weeks and 10 weeks and have disappeared by 10 weeks. So we've got a, a, a situation where we can make a lesion and then the lesion goes and then we have a piece of epithelium which used to be infected and then we can go and consider whether actually the virus is in there and what state it's in there and start to look at the latency a bit more detail. One of the techniques is very useful is one I mentioned earlier, which is laser capture microscopy. And this is just now, this is an established papilloma. This one's a stain for cycling B stowing the cells, the cells above the base layer in a G2-like state. They're susceptible to differentiation, but they're also in a, in a curious cell cycle state. And that's sustained for E4 in green. And the laser capture can be used to identify how many genomes there are per cell in different places. And in the rabbit, we find these sort of numbers. So the laser capture approach is very useful for studying these type of heterogeneous tissues, and it's a good complement to immunofluorescence staining in some instances. So to use this model, we first need a source of ROPV virions, and there's a number of ways we can do it. We can either scarify the tongue of a rabbit and keep it immunosuppressed, and uh, then the lesions don't go away, and the, the lesions cover the rabbit tongue and get lots of virus out that way. Or we can use little bits of rabbit tissue and plant it under the kidney capsule of a nude mouse, and we can get viruses out this way. And we can ban the viruses on a gradient and get this little band, and they look... And then you can use these for infection studies. So you can do real infection, you can do... In principle, you can do things like look at wound healing and look at how lesions form, and you can look at how lesions regress, and you can do latency studies, which is what we did. So one modification of this is we, we didn't just scarify the tongue. We used tattoo ink to mark where we'd, we'd made the little lesions. So here we've, we've taken a needle with some tattoo ink on, we've jabbed the tongue, and it's left a, a little tattoo mark, and the lesion is formed above the tattoo mark. And the rabbi lesions follow this sort of time course. They appear and then disappear. But well, because we've used the tattoo, the lesions appear, this is two weeks, the lesions appear above where the tattoo marks are. So that when the lesions regress, this is a lot of lymphocytes accumulating during regression. But when they regress, we get a piece of epithelium with a, a little mark below it, and we can go and try and study what's happening here and get some insight of whether, whether latency really exists. Because I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's debate about whether it exists. So we'll give you our perspective. Uh, the tongs after the lesions have got to look like this with the tattoo ink, but no lesions anymore. And it gives us the possibility of looking in this time frame, this green bit, where there's no lesions, but we know there used to be. And when we take whole lesion areas, of course, this is what other people have found. They find that the DNA persists for ages after the lesion's gone. And in the other systems where it's been used, which are dogs and cattle, you can see, and cottontail rabbits, the lesions will persist for a year. Uh, the DNA will persist for a year, and this is also what we found. And if you look for RNA, well, you can find that persistent, although it's a little bit harder, and we sort of fade out here. Curiously, these time points found it again, so you're obviously on the borderline of detection here. And I think the key difference between what we're trying to do and what's been done previously is we'd, we'd like to, we're trying to apply the laser capture method to identify. We know the DNA is still there, so we want to have a look at where it is. So the idea is we do basal cell laser capture, we do upper layer laser capture. This is how they come out. These little pieces get projected into a tube and uh, you can see where they are and see if you've collected what you need to collect. Um, and then you do PCR analysis. So I don't want to go too much into this. I'll just give you, give you the key things about this data. Well, here's an experiment where we've taken seven rabbits. The lesions are formed, lesions have regressed. And then we've had a look at how often we can find ROPV DNA are the sites where there used to be lesions. And we can't always do it. But in over, over half the time, we managed to get a, a sensible PCR signal from the, the bits of basal tissue. 
And when we looked at the copy number, it ranged enormously from many hundreds uh, up to just a few. So the copy numbers can be very, very low. But when we look at adjacent sites where there's no tattoo, they're massively lower. And in the upper layers, we usually get virtually nothing, except very, very occasionally, which we wonder whether there's some sort of spontaneous reactivation from latency. But when taken together, I think we really are becoming convinced that viral DNA does persist at regressed sites, and it persists in the base layer, perhaps a very low copy number, and perhaps with slow loss of basal cells after the lesions regress, of infected basal cells after regression. So it leads us to this sort of model. I'll just do this before the final couple of slides. Um, so if we consider a lesion now, a productively infected lesion, lesions persist for a long time, despite the presence of Langerhans cells and T cells which patrol the epithelium. And I guess this is because the virus has lots of tricks to avoid immune detection, such as keeping the viral proteins down to low levels in the lower layers, and also active methods where viral proteins actually interfere with the uh, display of peptides and, and uh, interfere on an, an cytokine response. But anyway, the virus manages to, to hide from the immune system for a variable length of time. Even in cervical lesions, most lesions have disappeared by 18 months after infection. So most lesions regress, but in a very small number of individuals, lesions persist. And this is where the problem is. But during normal regression, the idea is that it works like this. A Langerhans cell does actually pick up some peptides, takes them to the lymph nodes, uh, and immune response is mediated, and T cells uh, come back to the site of infection. I've drawn them here as entering the lesion, but actually what they actually do is congregate massively underneath more than enter. And I think the current thinking is the lesion disappears by a shut-off of viral gene expression. So the cells which the lymphocytes recognize as being foreign, the cytokine milieu, which they, the cytokines which they secrete, the idea is that they, they tend to shut off viral gene expression, which leads to the lesion clearing by the replacement of apparently normal cells from the basal layer. But these basal cells don't necessarily, are necessarily clear of viral genomes. It's just, they're just clear of significant viral gene expression. So we get the situation where the viral genome can persist in the base layer without any lesion. And it gives us the idea that the virus may persist latent and it may actually reappear when the immune system changes. So just in the final bit, we've been very, very, one of our main goals, just to finish off this, is to really get a system where we immunosuppress the animals and the lesions come back. And we know that the immune system is very important in controlling the outcome of infection. So the idea is we take these type of lesions, we immunosuppress the animal, and they turn it back to this. Okay. A lot of effort, we've never got that, uh, despite lots of animals, lots of analysis. Uh, one of the problems is that we have a problem in immunosuppressing the rabbits sufficiently, but preventing them uh, undergoing a significant weight loss. So it's a balance between the immunosuppression and the weight loss in the rabbits. I think the preliminary stuff, the preliminary data is now showing that we may just be about getting there because this shows uh, rabbits regress lesions and immunosuppression for 90 days and this shows the T cell counts going down. And this shows how the rabbit started at a particular time and in a number of rabbits how the, how the copy number increases. And in two of these, we've got a two, fo two log fold increase and something like a six log fold increase. So in a couple of rabbits now, we're starting to get evidence that if we prolong the immunosuppression for 90 days and we're very careful about maintaining it, the copy number tends to seep up, which suggests that the latent genomes can be reactivated. I think we finished this by looking to the future, and of course uh, there's rabbit or papillomavirus, but there's recently been a mouse papillomavirus reported, which I think uh, really needs to be distributed amongst the field and used widely, and something we need to use. Finished by just summarising. Well, the way the life cycle works, I think for a productive infection we need a very ordered gene expression pattern. And in the high-risk viruses, we have cell cycle uh, being drive, driven down here, but in the low-risk viruses, that's something which we don't see very often. These grades of disease, classified as different grades of neoplasia, are some degree of deregulation which occurs at particular sites. And I think the high-grade neoplasia is an extreme version of this deregulation. Integration can happen by chance, and when it does, I think this fixes the viral oncogenes over a long time. And it's facilitated by things like the loss of E2 and the, the increased levels of E6 and E7. But we also have to consider this other situation when the immune system does manage to clear disease 
and whether the disease actually, the virus actually persists. And I, I think the current thinking is that this is compatible with the virus persisting with some degree of immune surveillance and immune changes or other changes which occur can bring the lesions back. Uh, I'll just finish by, there's lots of people involved in, in the work I described over the years, uh, some of which are, dis, uh, are highlighted on this slide. And just say thank you for listening to all that, and I hope you got something out of it. Thank you.